Welcome. We're calling to order the January 9th uh, Planning Commission meeting. We'll start with a Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Um, at this moment, we'd like to turn the meeting over to staff to discuss the recognition of outgoing Planning Commission Chair, Jason Fan. Um, thank you, um, Commissioner Hutchinson. Um, just wanted to say a few words, and I would also like to encourage the Planning Commission to say a few words about uh, Commissioner Jason Padden. And we, um, the appreciation we've had for him being on the Planning Commission, um, We've really um, appreciated your leadership. Um, I think you're a person that really strives to make things better than they started in an organization, and that's very appreciated. We really appreciate your compassion for um, the commission, and that's going to be reflected, we believe, in the council appointment. Um, so that's just a words from staff. Uh, we have a uh, we have a gift and. Um, a card for you, uh, just as a small token of appreciation, but I just wanted to say thank you personally and I just for your commitment to the city of Canby. Well, thank you. Thank you, staff. Um, is there any other commissioners that would like to speak? Yes, Mr. Chair, if, you, if I can. Jason, I haven't known you for a tremendously long time, a year out of my life, but um, you know, I have to give high praise to anybody that is in volunteer status for the city that they live in. Um, I'm a big, big proponent of giving back, and uh, you fit that qualification to the nth degree. So all of the hours um, that you've spent, uh, one day you'll sit back and, and sit, you know, when you haven't got anything better to do, you're going to tally up all the hours, the tens of thousands of hours that you've spent reading applicants' stuff, staff reports, and whatnot. But I think it's your attention to, um, to coin a phrase, capture the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> 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 that we all uh, that we all uh, attain to make our town a better place. So personally, I want to thank you, and uh, it has uh, been an honor to know you. I know your address is not changing to a, a different town, so that's yep. a good thing. Yep. And uh, we hope to. Uh, I look forward to working with you and 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 doing stuff awesome. in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Anyone else like to speak? Yeah, I just want to say congratulations, Councillor Padden, and uh, you, you were the only uh, chair that I have known uh, my time as as a planning commissioner, uh, and I have really appreciated your passion and um, you know at times your uh, verbose nature in discussing uh, some topics. Um, sometimes meetings I thought would be very short. Um, we're not short at all, and, and but really made me think. Okay. And um, I, but most, mostly I, I really appreciated your drive to really do things and make fixes to the code that, you know, Camby's been talking about for 20, 30 years, and really to keep things moving and work with staff. There's nothing worse. There, there's a level of hell of this probably where you're on a board and nothing happens. <laughs> and whether it's a city council or a planning commission or whatever, and you're just like spinning your wheels. And I don't feel like we did that this year. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for welcoming me onto my first commission ever uh, and making that experience uh, what it uh, all it could be. And I appreciate the guidance and the help along the way, particularly with the phraseology and the Robert's rule of order uh, comments. I, I still haven't mastered yet, but I will get there. Um, congratulations to you uh, on uh, becoming a city council 
member, and uh, I'm certain we'll be working with you in the future. So congrats. Thank you. Thank you. And J Jason, um, I would like to give you the, the card, it would, if you, unless you'd like to say yes, something. May, real yes, please. Go ahead. I promise yeah. I'll try to get yeah. <laughs> I know it's a long meeting. Yeah. Uh, I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to uh, say thank you for those kind words. Uh, it, is, it is greatly appreciated. And primarily thank you for uh, continuing to serve this community. I know, you know, as uh, Commissioner Ebert was saying, sometimes it is a thankless job. Job, but those that you impact through these decisions, while they may not know it, really they do appreciate it. And I appreciate all of the work that you did over the years through this process and supporting me as the chair, even though at times it might have been a bit archaic and I got off on a bit, bit of tangents. Um, as I said before, and I will just say again, um, I will continue, even though I'm not the um, liaison to the Planning Commission, I will continue to serve as your advocate uh, to the City Council and ensure that the work that you are doing here makes its way up to them. So I look very forward to pushing on your behalf to get the uh, fence ordinance uh, work sessions on the calendar as soon as possible and uh, all those things. And then to the planning department, the same thing. I appreciate all your help in, in making sure that I didn't get the city in a lawsuit uh, through my time as chair and as a member of the planning commission. And uh, I will continue to serve as an advocate for, for you folks as well. And if ever anything comes up or you have questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You all have my contact information and I'll be happy to Happy to hear what you have to say and, and listen. So, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. There you go. Thank you. Is that when we talk about our pay raises? <laughs> yes, you get a card. <laughs> well, good luck with the rest of your meeting and, and have a great night. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Uh, for myself, I would like to say, Jason, I think you're going to look back on your time of obscurity fondly. Uh, it's done now. Everyone knows who you are. You will not get to have a peaceful day at the grocery store going forward. That I hope you problem. enjoy it. <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Excellent. So, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Have a good one. Have a good night. All right, and on that note, I would like to commission or welcome our new commissioner, Craig Llewellyn, uh, who is uh, appointed for the vacancy from the city council. Do you have anything you'd like to say? I get used to this thing. Uh, no, I just look forward to working with you all, learning from you, and uh, I know some of you have been here a long time. I was talking to Dan here, uh, and so I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, all right, well, I guess at this point we need to come up with a new chair and vice chair as the terms have rolled over. I'm starting a whole new term here. I actually completed a, an entire term as a commissioner. Wow, I didn't realize it would be so rare. Um, <laughs> so um, I will open the floor for nominations for chairman. Chairperson, I should say. Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I would like to move at this time to nominate Mr. Matt Ellison as our chairman. And um, I think he would do a great job. So I make that nomination. Thank you. Mr. Chair, or Vice Chair, am I saying that right? I got to get used to all this. I nominate Dan Ewart to be the chairman. Do we have any seconds? It's just you and me. Who, want, um, <laughs> commission, who wants it more? I'll, I'll second both the nominations. This is Judy. Yeah. Oh, what, what, what oh, Judy's. Yeah. Yes. I forgot Judy. What did you she, say? Yeah, she's on. She's on. She what is. did you say, ma'am? I said I'll second both nominations. <laughs> Looks like we have a vote. I think I think that we have we have to vote on. Well, I don't know. Each one of them, do we vote on them separately? 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I guess we will start with a vote for Commissioner Matt Ellison to be chair of the Planning Commission. Um, I'll just go down the list, I suppose, uh, and start with Dan Ewart. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Llewellyn. A nay. Um, Commissioner Jaroche. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Calkins. Yes. Commissioner Ellison. Yes, please. I also vote aye. Um, not sure where we go with this now. now we, <laughs> I guess since they were both seconded, now we vote on the motion, right, to reword or, or that one passed. That so one was first. Done. And that's what it is. Congratulations. Experts in the back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Now, do you now what? Do I, do now, now we do vice chair. Vice, vice chair. chair. Opening uh, the, the floor for nominations for vice chair. I nominate Mr. Dan Ewert. I'll second that. All right. Shall we go down the list? Uh, let's, uh, we'll go the other directions. Uh, Commissioner Calkins. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Jaroche. Yes. Commissioner Lumelli. Yes. Commissioner Ellison. Yes. Commissioner Ewood. I'm voting for myself. I, I'll abstain. <laughs> <laughs> I vote yes as well. Okay. Looks like the motion is carried. Congratulations. Vice President. So, do I hand the meeting off to the new officers at this point? Uh, I would say that would be, you know, up to um, up to you um, if you would like to do so, um, Commissioner Hutchinson. Happy to. Take it, brother. Okay. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to still, I'm gonna still work. There's a reason why, though, I'll tell you in a minute. I'll get to the other kit here. All right. Okay. Well, ideally, this will be the last one that I chair. So it sounds like I'm heading in the right direction. So. All right. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to consent items, please. Um, draft Planning Commission meetings, meeting minutes for March 14th, 2022. Do I have a motion to accept? I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Carried. There she is. Oh, she went away again. Oh, well, she was there briefly. All right. At this point, we have citizen input on non-agenda items. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on non-agenda items. Each person will be given three minutes to speak. Staff and the Planning Commission will make every effort to respond to questions raised during citizen's input before the meeting ends or as quickly as possible thereafter. You may speak on non-agenda items via Zoom. Um, it's a little bit late for all that, so I think if you don't have that information, then you probably will not be having anything to say. Is there anything? I, I don't believe there's anybody in the lobby uh, on the Zoom or, or that is, uh, I guess the question is anybody in person, Al? Yes. No one has anything to say? All right, we'll close that section. Um, new business. Do we have any? No, okay. we, do, we do not. All right. Well, tonight there's a matter before the hearing body that requires a public hearing. Um, is that... That's where you... Yeah, this, is, this is for the Historical Society as well. It, it is. Okay. So, so I, you can just do that. Uh, actually, you should probably do it each time on the, the script uh, before each hearing. All right. Thank you. Tonight, there's a matter before the hearing body that requires a public hearing. All questions must be directed through the chair. Any evidence to be considered must be submitted to the hearing body for public access. All written testimony received both for and against shall be summarized by staff and presented briefly to the hearing body during staff report. 
Testimony and evidence must be directed toward the applicable review criteria contained in the staff report, the comprehensive plan, or other land use regulations which the person believes apply to this decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision makers and the parties the opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. Um, at this time, I would ask that any member of the hearing body who has a conflict of interest please indicate the nature and extent of the conflict and whether you intend to participate in or abstain from the hearing, from hearing the present matter. No conflict. I see none. Thank you. Um, ex parte contact. Also, if any member of the hearing body has had any ex parte contact with anyone prior to this hearing, including a visit to the site, please declare the nature and extent of the contact at this time. I have that. So this is Judy. Um, I should probably abstain from voting too, although this vote certainly doesn't benefit me personally. Uh, one might say I've been heavily involved because of my being the chair of the Heritage and Landmark Commission. I also chaired the public hearing that was required for the Heritage and Landmark Commission to move this forward to the Planning Commission. So I'll just say I'll abstain from a vote. Uh, I have been to the Canby Duke Depot Museum many times. Um, I looked up my wife's yearbook picture one time. <laughs> uh, my daughter played on that old piano that they have in there. Um, it's really, if you haven't been there, Canby, you got to check it out. It's, it's a, just a snapshot of our rich cultural history. Uh, but I plan to participate. Uh, I drive by it frequently, and that's the extent of my interaction. <coughs> Anyone else? Commissioner I do Hutchinson. have been to the Kenby uh, Museum on numerous occasions. Uh, uh, like Chris, I encourage every Kenby citizen to go and check it out. And, um, you know, personally, Judy, on my behalf, I don't have a problem with you uh, sitting, uh, participating in this. So, um, it's up to you, but I, I, I would I would value your input. Okay, thank you. Are you going to do the same reading for both? Okay. Yes. All right. So good. I'm I'm good on the first one. Okay. <laughs> Um, and just as a clear point of clarification, this is a recommendation of approval to the council. Yes. So. I'm sorry. I don't think I mentioned that. HLC 2201, Canby Historical Society, <laughs> Canby Depot Museum, uh, 884 Northeast 4th Avenue, Jamie Stickle, Economic Director. Um, <clears throat> so the public hearing will be conducted as follows. Um, staff will speak for five minutes. Questions, if any, by the public, by the hearing body or staff. Chair will then open the public hearing for testimony. The applicant will get 20 minutes, proponents three minutes, opponents three minutes, and a rebuttal 10 minutes. And then the chair will close the public hearing. Questions, if any, by the hearing body, and then discussion by the hearing body. A decision shall be made by the hearing body at the close of this hearing, or the matter will be continued to a date certain in the future. This will be the only notice of that date you will receive. Does anyone have any questions about the procedure of the hearing? In that case, I will leave the, send the floor to the staff. Uh, good evening, Jamie Stickle, Economic Development Director and Communication Specialist for the City of Canby. Um, tonight we will be discussing the Canby Depot Museum and the addition of a historical protection overlay zone. So tonight before you I will present the applicant request and background, um, criteria for historic landmark and historic district designation which includes aspects of um, Chapter 16 of the Canby Municipal Code. Um, and we'll further go into the historic integrity and significance of this building. Um, and then also the recommendation from city staff. So the applicant request, um, the city of Canby received an application from the Canby Historical Society to include the Canby Depot Museum, which is located at 888 Northeast 4th Avenue um, to the local register of historic resources. 
The Planning Commission approval would result in the Historical Protection Overlay Zone designation as outlined in Chapter 16.110.05, or 045, rather. Uh, the Heritage and Landmark Commission approved this application at the December 5th public hearing. Um, they recommended that um, the application was then brought forward to the Planning Commission and then finally to City Council for approval of the Historical Protection Overlay Zone designation. Um, and that process um, and, and each one of its stops is all um, outlined in the historic code. Um, for background, the Canby Historical Society held a neighborhood meeting Tuesday, November 1st for interested property owners, which were located within 500 feet of the Depot Museum. They were, received a letter inviting them to the meeting, um, and the, it was an opportunity for them to come together, review, and consider the proposal. Um, the Canby Depot Museum is eligible for the Local Register of Historic Resources due to its association with early development of Canby um, as a shipping and distribution center on Southern Pacific's mainline, and that linked Portland to California. The railroad brought economic flexibility, open markets for shipping local crops and goods, and increased the number of permanent residents in the city. Um, and then further some background, um, in 1870, Oregon and California Railroad um, and the filing of the town um, Platt led to the construction of a rail depot. In fall of 1891, a windstorm toppled the structure, which forced Southern Pacific to build a rail placement, and that was completed in 1892. Canby continued to grow, and Southern Pacific responded on multiple occasions to either update or enlarge the facility, um, which was most uh, prominently seen in 1911, when approximately 20 feet was added to the warehouse portion of the depot. Um, that added additional space for people and goods, as well as Western Union and Railway Express, um, and it remained in operation until 1976. Um, in 1978, Southern Pacific offered to donate the building to the community and Mayor Robert Rapp appointed an advisory committee. The City Council passed Resolution 252 to declare the depot a historic site, um, which subsequently does not actually, did not actually put it on the register, but um, they, they passed a resolution to make sure that they were preserving that building. Um, the only stipulation from Southern Pacific was that the depot structure, it was removed from the property on Northwest First Avenue, um, and they wanted that done in a timely manner by a professional moving company. Um, in 1983, the depot was removed from that location on Northwest First Avenue. Um, it was situated perpendicular to the railroad tracks so that it could fit on the site, um, and it was uh, placed on a new concrete foundation. A community group rehabilitated the deteriorating structure and repurposed it to become the museum that it is today. And at that time, renovations included a new roof, replacement of rotten siding, restoration of windows and doors, rebuilding the loading ramp, painting and other exterior tasks, as well as interior work, which included the addition of a bathroom, installation of display cases, storage cabinets, and um, lowering the warehouse floor to make it level with the office floor. Uh, October 6th of 1984, the Canby Depot Museum was formally introduced um, at a grand opening. Um, so now to speak a little bit to the criteria for the historic landmark. Um, 16.110.040, the Register of Historic Landmarks and Historic Districts. Um, I pulled just part of some of this information out so that I could further go into it. Um, but the Historic and Landmarks Commission shall maintain a register of historic landmarks and historic districts consisting of all properties so designated by the City Council. The three structures already designated under the historic overlay provisions in 1984 were added to the Register of Historic Landmarks. Designated historic landmarks and historic districts shall have the historical protection overlay zone applied to them unless city council finds that such zoning is not appropriate to a specific piece of property. Um, 16.110.045, the designation procedure for historic landmarks and historic districts. Um, oh, I have a bit of a typo. Um, that should be 045, the second um, calling out of that. Uh, municipal code. Um, but in after review, notice and public hearing as specified, the historic landmarks commission, the, hist the Heritage and Landmarks Commission shall make a decision on the city's historic landmark or historic desi district designation. In addition, the Heritage and Landmarks Commission shall make a recommendation to the Canby Planning Commission and City Council for assignment of the historical protection overlay zone. 
Upon receipt of the record of the historic or the Heritage and Landmarks Commission proceedings and the recommendation of the Heritage and Landmarks Commission, the Planning Commission shall conduct a review of that record and shall make a recommendation to the City Council on the overlay zone designation. Um, further, the City Council shall conduct a review of the records of both the Heritage and Landmarks Commission and Planning Commission and shall vote to approve, deny, and approve subject to modifications the recommendation that has been forwarded to them. The Planning Commission and City Council may, but not are not required to, hold new public hearings on the matter. Um, in the Canby Municipal Code, um, 16.110055. Um, I also wanted to include the criteria. Um, so in order to designate building sites, objects, or structures as historic, um, it shall be found that they are 50 years or older, which the Canby Depot Museum is, um, and that there is historical, architectural, or environmental significance. Um, I underlined historical because uh, the applicant provided additional information um, on the historical integrity and historical significance of this structure. Um, and as it is called out in our code, the historical significance, um, it's the association with the life and activities of a person, group, organization, or institution that has made a significant contribution to the city, county, state, or nation. Um, association with an event that has made a significant contribution. Association with broad patterns of cultural, political, social, economic, industrial, or agricultural history. Potential for providing information of a prehistoric or historic nature in the city, county, state, or nation or listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which this is not at this time. Um, as far as the historic integrity is, uh, the building, again, built in 19, or 1891 and 92 is Southern, Standard Southern Pacific Design Number 11, Combination Depot. The Canby Depot is a rectangular structure with a wood frame and post and beam floor structure. It features a side gable and wide overhang eaves and shaped diagonal braces. The building is clad in horizontal board siding composed of cedar. Exterior trim boards are placed over the siding at vertical and horizontal angles. The prominent windows of the depot are 12 over four double, hang, double hung sash windows. The original windows were replaced in 2018 with vinyl windows, which present the same look as the original. The original wood window frames remain, and one of the original windows is on display in the museum. So mark that on your calendars and go check it out. Uh, the cedar shake roof was placed with composite shingles during the 1983-84 restoration and replaced again in 2019. The removal of the warehouse addition returned the building to its pre-1911 footprint, although the perpendicular, perpendicular siding of the depot um, to, the ra to the railroad track is a significant alteration. The overall integrity of the structure could be characterized as adequate. Um, and then as far as the historical significance goes, um, Canby's Southern Pacific Depot is eligible for listing um, on the local register um, with its association with early development in Canby as a shipping and distribution center on the Southern Pacific's main line that linked Portland to California. Um, as noted previously, the railroad brought greater economic flexibility. It opened markets for shipping local crops and goods um, and increased the number of permanent residents. Um, and Myra Weston, who was fundamental in, the, in capturing the history of Canby and, and the depot itself, noted that the depot was the heart of the city, which has grown up around it. Passengers for Portland, San Francisco, and points between and beyond bought tickets and boarded trains at the depot. Incoming and outgoing mail was received and dispatched from there for Canby's um, Canby and Rural Post Office in the vicinity. Um, tons of products in the area's productive soils were shipped out of Canby, and merchandise was received there for firms in the area until motor vehicle superseded the steam and later the diesel train. For almost nine decades, the depot was the focal point of the community's commercial core and a fundamental element of its agricultural-based economy. Um, Southern Pacific Railroad was vital to the development of Canby, um, and that extends west from Louisiana to California and north to Oregon. The firm constructed nine standard number 11 combination depots in Oregon, and as one of three remaining, Canby's depot is an architecturally significant structure. The depot's association with a long list of civic leaders and activists who contributed in multiple ways to Canby's development contribute also contributes to its significance. Um, Myra Weston, who served as secretary and president um, of the 
SDC uh, co-owned the Canby Herald with her husband. Um, she served as a reporter and editor and co-founded the city's business and professional women's club. As a member, she was instrumental in the campaign that resulted in the election of Bertha Dedman as the city's first woman mayor. Weston was a charter member from the Canby of the Canby Historical Society, and in 1966, she spearheaded the effort to pass an initiative to increase the city's tax base from 14,000 to 70,000. Um, the ballot measure passed by a vote of 420 to 324, and she was elected to the position of city treasurer and served in that role for multiple years. After her retirement, Weston led the Chamber of Commerce as, as its executive director, um, which was, a, and not only was she a driving force behind the effort to save the depot, but she put that same expertise and energy into the community pool campaign and funding and organizing Canby's 100th anniversary commemoration. Um, most importantly, her determination to record and preserve Canby's history has created an invaluable record of the community's past, which is accessible at the, the depot museum. Um, the depot's association with Herman Bergman, um, who was the station agent from 1958 to 1976, adds to its historic significance. Bergman was a tireless advocate for saving the structure and repurposing it as a museum. And after the relocation was complete, he served for two decades as museum director and is responsible for many of the additions um, to the document archive, as well as the artifact collection, including the acquisition of the caboose in 1989. The collection is the heart of the museum and an irreplaceable record of the community's history. And last, the depot's historic significance is embedded in its connection to two families that shaped Canby's pre-1900 development, the Lees and the Knights. Philander Lee sold 111 acres of his donation land claim to uh, ONC, which I cannot remember. Oregon and California. Alcorn, Oregon and California, thank you. Uh, Lee had insisted on including a provision in the sales agreement that required the firm to build a depot, and the decision proved critical to the emergence of a small town in what had been a farming area devoid of commercial structures. By 1892, when the second depot replaced the first, Canby had a thriving main street and a growing population, and one year later, the city was incorporated. Um, and then Joseph Knight, in 1868, he purchased the um, Seely and Jocelyn donation land claims, moving his large extended family from Butteville to Canby. In 1870, he sold a small portion to the Oregon and California um, Railway, Railroad? Yes. And uh, after the completion of the rail line through Canby, his adult sons began to transform the community. For example, William and George constructed the Knight Mercantile. Charles built a, um, a pharmacy on the west side of what is now Grant Street. Joseph erected a sawmill on the Malala River. George built a grist mill. Adam opened a blacksmith shop. The Knights constructed homes, a hotel, schoolhouse, and multiple commercial structures. William Knight became civically and politically active, and he was instrumental in the city's 1893 incorporation. The first city council meeting took place on the second floor of the Knight building, with Knight serving as city recorder and, her and Heeman, Philander Lee's son, as mayor. Staff um, recommends the Planning Commission include the historical, preser uh, the historical Protection Overlay Zone designation for the Canby Depot Museum as outlined in Canby Municipal Code 16.110.040 and 0405. All right, does anyone have questions? I have one. First of all, good presentation. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody's effort for preserving this. My only question is, this is sitting on a 10,120 foot square foot lot. I personally think the depot is pretty cool. If we ever wanted to add on to it, does what we're passing tonight prohibit us from doing that? That is an excellent question. Um, the city's municipal code talks about if there's an alteration to a historic landmark, if you have to move one. So for example, in 2014, the city of Canby um, assisted in the move of the Mac House, which is on our historic register. Um, it, there's a process, but it is not what I would consider to be long and arduous. It's you know a, a public hearing with the Heritage and Landmark Commission. Um, if there was an alteration or um, 
an addition. I think that that's something that would, again, go through the Heritage and Landmark Commission. But putting the designation does not prohibit moving it, demolishing it. Obviously, we don't want to see that happen um, or altering it. It just helps to protect that structure so that there is some um, additional oversight um, from the Heritage and Landmark Commission and, and the city on that. Okay. Because as we grow, I would I could see us maybe wanting to put the old warehouse back on it. Yeah. You know, match it, make it look good. Uh, it's in a great location as far as the fairgrounds is concerned for people to visit the fairgrounds and say, oh, what's that? Right. So I think that would be, uh, some more signage would be good. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, a good example is like our, the historic city hall is on our historic register and there's been lots of alterations and additions there and, and that has gone through the process. So yes, that would not prohibit um, somebody doing things to add to it. And um, I am sure the historical society would love if you want to volunteer to help take on that project. I'll get out my hammer. There you go. <laughs> so, so does that include to, um, if it ever wanted to be moved to a different lot? I'm, I think I'm hearing you saying yes. that. Yes. So about. Um, is 16.110075 is moving or demolition of a landmark and or contributing resource. So yes, it would be, um, it would follow the process. Um, and uh, the way that that works to my, in my vague memory is that there is a um, public hearing with the Heritage and Landmark Commission. Um, and and I think that that can be appealed up the chain. So then I believe that the appeal would come to, to the Planning Commission and then City Council. Um, but it's a relatively straightforward process. And I, I think that, you know, the, the, maybe the longest part of, or the, the part that would take the longest is, is if there's any public notice that would have to happen, because um, there's some time that goes on with that. But it's not a long process. So. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I, great history lesson. Uh, excellent uh, job. I had a question I heard in my time in Canby uh, through the Canby grapevine. Um, you, there might be someone here who knows about this if you don't. Um, about, say, 12 years ago, uh, there was a grant to move the depot from the current industrial zone site back to where it was or closer to where it was. Um, do you know anything about that and why it wasn't done at that time? No, I, I don't know about that. Um, and the only thing I can think of is 12 years ago, we were probably planning for the Northwest First Avenue redevelopment, which started in 2012. Uh, the, the actual construction started in 2012. Um, and I know that when First Avenue was redeveloped, the city uh, had previously had um, an agreement with um, the railroad Union Pacific for extra land, which is why if you were if you were in Canby or aware of Canby, the parking on First Avenue used to be, I think, about double in size. It was before my time, but that that was reduced. So it's possible that there was not space. But I don't I don't know about that. Is the original spot where it was, like next to the arch where that sequoia tree, is that? Okay, and the and the land that it's on now doesn't have any significance historically, and is surrounded by is zoned all industrial around it, or like Austin's Correct. and and all that. Correct. Okay. I, I think the only uh, I don't and I don't know that this is um, necessarily applicable, but I think the only historical significance of that area where it's situated now is just that now it's been there for nearly, I mean, not quite 50 years, but right. nearly 50 years. So there's historical significance in the sense that that's where the Depot Museum has been housed for that time. But um, I don't know of any additional. Okay. Thank you. Anything? <clears throat> I guess we should open it to the public. Um, if there are any proponents that have anything to say regarding the project. Looks like. I guess I'm the applicant, so I get the 20 minutes. Okay. Good. So thank you, Planning Commission members, for this opportunity for the Canby Historical Society to move forward with something that's been on their agenda for some time. Um, my name is Carol Palmer. I'm a member of the CHS. I have a PhD in history. And Nora Clark, who is president of the Canby Historical Society, is here. So when we get to that question and answer period, she's available as well as I am. Uh, so next slide. So what I've done for you here is um, 
First of all, you should all know that this is only the second time this, this organization or this body has actually done this in the last 25 years when the code changed and the designation process went in place. And so the last time it was done was in 2016, and that was for the um, City Hall, Holly, Holly Street City Hall. And I happened to be in the same role at that time. I was the, speaking as on behalf of the applicant. I'd written the application. But I know that all of you, I don't think any of you were on the, the Planning Commission at that time. So this is your first. So I thought it would be helpful on the left side of the presentation. I've just kind of, and, can't, uh, and Jamie's already done this, but just what's the criteria, just so you have that in mind. And then I put through the process too, so you could see that. And then on the left side, I've got the timeline for the ONC Railroad and the S&P uh, Railroad in Canby, real high level, very high level, but I thought that might be helpful. Next page. And I think this is going to answer some of your questions. Um, why is designation important? I really think that if you're going to do this, it's, it's important for you to know why it's important. But it's also important to know what it means. So the first thing is, of course, getting the, the preservation, uh, the historic zoning overlay, is going to help preserve the building. That's the number one thing. And in this case, that means all proposed exterior alterations are subject to the design or subject to design review. The focus of the design review is is the effect of the alteration on the property's historic integrity. Um, the minor uh, alterations can be approved by the planning director. Major alterations have to go through the Heritage and Landmark Commission public hearing. And the appeal is not to the planning commission if um, the applicant or the opponents don't like the, uh, that. It, it's, the appeal goes directly to the city council. Um, and I thought it would be helpful if I gave you some examples of what is considered minor in real time? The real stuff that they've really done, how would that have been handled had they been designated at that time? So a couple of years ago, I think it was 2019, um, they replaced the original, not the original roof, but they replaced the roof that had been in place since 1983. Now, that particular alteration, uh, because it was not the original roof, it wasn't even the original roofing material on that roof, and because the alteration did absolutely nothing to impact any part of the building that contained historic integrity, it did not change the, the profile, the footprint, or the appearance of the building, I would have recommended, if somebody had asked, that that would be considered a minor alteration. It's literally repair. It's like for like. And everybody knows that roofing material does not have an, a, a long life. It, it, you have to replace it sometime. The window replacement that took place, I think it was about a year later, was a different story. Those windows were the original. There had been some effort put in at the time the structure was moved in 1984, 1983, to restore those. There is, in the, in the marketplace, we have products, we have techniques, and we have professionals that are masters of extending the life of old windows. So that is something that could be done without any you know, without taking anything away from the historic integrity of the windows, the replacement with vinyl windows definitely reduced the historic integrity of the property, and that would have needed would have been considered a major alteration and would have had to go to the Heritage Land, Heritage and Landmark Commission. Um, I think the really important part of doing this is you're establishing public a forum for public input, and you're establishing an appeal process. Well, you, those, you're putting it into a, a process that has those two components in it. And I think that's important for, when you're going to say this is a community historic resource, I think that's important for the community to have that. Um, one of the very important reasons for the Canby Historical Society that we want to have this designation is it opens access to grants that are restricted to designated properties. It is not cheap to replace windows. It is not cheap to replace a roof. They just painted. So old buildings are money pits. And culturally uh, based nonprofits like Canby Historical Society are financially fragile just by their very nature. So grants are a critical, critical component to continuing to preserve that building and to do the right thing. Um, a great example, Mark Prey Schoolhouse, as you may know, was severely damaged in the, what was it, February 21 ice storm. 
Um, three oak trees came down. The cost, the total cost is gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of $600,000 to replace that. Yeah, I know. 400,000 will be paid by the insurance company. Yay. 200,000 they're having to raise. And I just uh, yesterday got an email from the person who is working those grant requests. So far they have 90,000 in grant requests because the property is designated. It is a can be property, but it's outside of the city limits. So it's designated by the county. And that just opened doors to grants, no questions asked, recognizing the damage that had been done and what the plan was to save the structure. Um, and she believes that she's got another 30,000 in the pipeline. Um, preservation, another reason that organizations, these granting organizations, or one of the reasons these granting organizations like to have um, a designation of property with a designation is because of the design review process. They know that they're investing money that's going to be where on a property that's going to have some oversight over its historic integrity. So that's one of the reasons. What makes that even more attractive for them is that designation lasts for the lifetime of the structure, even after an ownership change. That's a state Supreme Court ruling, Lake Oswego Preservation Society versus City of Lake Oswego. Um, in that case, it went to the, their Heritage and Landmark Commission, City Council, LUBA, Court of Appeals, all uh, approved the removal of the designation and the Supreme Court ruled against that, State Supreme Court. Um, and that, of course, is consistent with the Secretary of Interior Standards, which is the basis of our preservation code here in Canby. Um, if the Canby Historical Society should dissolve, which could happen, not not soon, but could. Another pandemic, you know, last pandemic, we lost World of Speed before we even had a mask mandate. Um, we lost the Children's Museum in Portland very early on. So luckily, and thanks to the, uh, Nora and all the folks on the board there, they have done a great job of keeping it financially stable. Um, but if it dissolved, the collection would become the property of the Clackamas County Historical Society. The property with the structure reverts to city ownership, and that's per the deed. And that was that deed stipulation was put in there by um, the city administrator and the city council at the time the property was deeded to the to the Canby Historical Society. So even at that point, there had been a that change of ownership. Um, because it would become a public property at that point, um, there is an Oregon Revised Statute that um, has some regulations in it that would still protect the property, but it would not be a process that is subject to community input or to an appeal process. So the designation is important to keep that, that part of the process in place. Oops, don't do that. Another reason this is really, um, it was really important, I think, personally for me and for Nora, was we wanted to establish an accurate and complete record of the structure's history, an actual public, official public record, if you will. The reason for that is there is so much information about the depot that is um, conflicting. Um, and we wanted to separate fact and fiction. And so um, it, when I started off with the research about a year ago, maybe even before that, I'm slow. Um, there were some rules we put in place to say, you know, we want to make sure that this can stand the test of time and has all of the documentation that it needs to back it up. So what I did was I used primary sources whenever they were available. Uh, when there was conflicting information, I made sure I double sourced. Um, that's the whole list of places where we either went or where either went or that we both did both online and sometimes in person. And the really important thing was footnote, footnote, footnote. We wanted to leave, I wanted to leave a track record. So anybody looking at the, the historical record would, would know exactly where I've been and what I looked at and what, the, what those things had said. So, And so what were the conclusions of all that research? The depot is a Southern Pacific Standard Design number 11, as, as Jamie has mentioned. Um, contrary to popular opinion sometimes out in the, the uh, community. It is not the oldest depot in the uh, Oregon. It's not the oldest surviving. Uh, it's old. It's historic in and of itself. And so having that misinformation out in there sort of detracts from the real historic significance of the property. And I've given you the two um, uh, sources that I use, relied on the most. Oregon City Enterprise, 1890, 1892. 
Um, I was really shocked. One of the things I wasn't expecting was when I did the research that I found that the community's pop popular history of the railroad and its depots is very shallow in terms of uh, it overlooks and minimizes people, actions, events that were critical, in some cases transformational in terms of the evolution of the community. So what I've tried to do in the historic significance is identify some people that have, I think have been left out of the story and identify some events that I thought were, and, and in particular, we have a Philander Lee's sales agreement uh, at least a copy of it, which is so significant. And it's and one of the things he stipulated in that sales agreement is that the ONC Railroad was to build a depot in Canby. And um, and some, oh, he also stipulated where the, the cow crossing should be and a couple of other things. But um, would the ONC have actually built a depot if he hadn't put that in the sales agreement? I don't think so. Um, Railroads were a new thing, um, they're, at least in Oregon. They were very expensive to build. You didn't have to just build the railroad. You also had to buy the, the, uh, the uh, engines and the, all of the, the uh, cars that went with it. And those all had to be shipped in. So it was a huge, huge investment. So did you want to build a building in Canby, Oregon, which didn't even exist at the time, a city that was just nothing but fields and orchards? I don't know. Um, so that's just one example. Um, that, and I also want to emphasize that the amount and quality of the primary source material in the depot collection is remarkable, really remarkable for a community museum. If you go behind the curtain in the back room, there is file cabinet after file cabinet filled with primary documents. That's super unusual for a small community museum. Typically, you'll open one of those files and you'll find um, newspaper articles. Nothing wrong with newspaper articles, but you go over to the Canby Depot Museum, you've got the original uh, record books of the Canby Women's Civics Club going back to 1924. You have minutes, and there are more city documents I'm hoping they're copies of city documents, <laughs> internal memos, um, staff reports, than even the city has about the depot, in fact. In fact, if you look at, well, it, there's one point where I'm listing in, uh, city uh, records time after time after time in the footnotes, notes, but the source material is all over at the depot museum. So it was important just to say that's another reason why you should vote yes today. That's it. Thank you. Do you have a question, Commissioner? Yeah, thank you. Carol, can I ask you a question? Is that okay now? I can kind of wait for the question period to let the opponents or... Oh, yeah. I think, maybe. Um, why don't we see if there are other proponents and opponents, okay. and then we could go right into that. Okay. okay. Do we have any um, other than the applicant proponents of this proposal? Looks like no. Any opponents? You, you may rebut the silence if you like. <laughs> um, I guess we'll, at this point, close the public hearing, unless, and then we go on to questions from the hearing body. Uh, you could ask questions now before you close it. Um, I think that might okay. be a good idea. Just if you have the opportunity here, I think it would be good to do that, uh, okay. if there are questions. <clears throat> Just one quick one. Is there a way to make the building itself have that historical protection without changing the zoning of the land that it's on? I, I'm not an expert on zoning, so that question needs to go to those people over there. Oh, okay, maybe that was pretty interesting. <clears throat> it occurred question, to though. me during your, yeah. your talk. Yeah, it, this is really more of an, an overlay versus a zone change. So this is a really a protection over the property, but not really, it's not really redesignating this property. So the zoning is the base zone still exists on that property. Light industrial. Yes. So that's another reason to protect the property is that the underlying zoning would allow things to happen there if there was not protection for that building. Okay. Thank you. Any others? Okay. So then now we will close the public hearing. Thank Questions? You. Any from the commissioners? Any by the hearing body? 
None. Um, well, I guess I would entertain a motion. Well, are we going to have a discussion? Are we? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have some discussion. Okay. Excellent. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think any argument can be made that um, the depot uh, isn't of historical significance. Without it, can be as we know it would not be here. And so, um, and, and I truly... Uh, truly appreciate the work that that you do and that the, and that the historical landmark uh, commission does, and um, I'm excited about this. I think when I was, but I'm also reminded that um, Canby is running low on industrial land, and it makes me. Uh, it's it's on my mind, you know, and and when the UGB uh, expands, um, the amount of farmland that that might be paved over, um, and just just that whole idea. Can it, actually reading and thinking about it, it reminded me a little bit about the Sequoia Apartments, you know, where we have really great uh, industrial zoning in a place that makes sense for it. And um, I, but I agree that apartments should be in Canby. I agree that we need more uh, low-income housing and more apartments for for people. But does that mean what that was necessarily the spot for it? And um, and with complete all due respect to Mayor uh, Robert Rapp, may he rest in peace with his amazing sideburns. I'm. Uh, you know, I'm not sure why that spot was chosen. It's industrial all around it. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as Maya Weston said, you know, the, the depot's the heart of Canby. I would like to see it moved back downtown for a number of reasons. Um, I think that it, it can't, it, it's more, it would be more of a tourist destination downtown. It would draw more people into downtown. Um, I think where it is right now, you drive past it on the way to the fair and leaving the fair. Also, I read the 2004 transportation plan, and Pines, that intersection is one of the most dangerous in Canby. And kids, elementary school kids, have to walk there for, for field trips. And, you know, that, that whole area I don't think is, is great for walking compared to um, our downtown. And I don't know if it could be ever moved back to its original place because of the changes that have taken uh, back. But I do believe it could be a win-win, and we could have a, a both and. And I have a recommendation, but I want to hear from every, everyone about what we can do to preserve, because I also think that we need more historical preservation downtown. Uh, we don't need really historical preservation way out in the outskirts by Pine Street. We need it more about downtown. We've got our murals are being paved over by, by you know, uh, folks who, who own new buildings and they're painting over our historical murals instead of restoring them. You know, I want to see some of that brought back to downtown, and there's other land downtown um, if the original spot can't be, uh, you know, procured or, or des designed. And I think there are grants for these things. I've, I've, I've heard of grants there. There was a grant at one time. It wasn't, they didn't take up, they didn't t take it up, and I'm not sure why. Um, but that's my opinion. I want to hear what everyone has to say. I have a recommendation that might be a win-win where we could use light industrial and it puts the depot at, back in the heart of Canby where it truly belongs. Thank you. Commissioner sure Ewart. I agree with you, Chris, <laughs> to a degree. Um, yeah, I, I don't have, personally, uh, I don't have a problem with where it's at. I think that being next to the fairgrounds is, is a good place for it. Uh, I think that maybe possibly even, I don't know if it's been pursued, but if we wanted to have a bigger footprint there, that maybe the fairgrounds could donate some land to, so that we could expand our um, train station uh, museum thing. Uh, it looks like there could be a possibility of expansion there. The one thing that I do uh, 
you know, as Canby has grown, we have these little pieces of industrial all over. This, this is a, a great example of, of an area like that. And somebody at one point thought it was great to have a little industrial piece there, and it, we kind of, it didn't work very good. And at least it doesn't work well now. Uh, back where I live, we've got an industrial park, and, and you know, there's some great uh, industrial folks there, but it kind of, it was a great idea at the time, but not so great now. It could be actually used up for something much better. And uh, I agree that we're gonna we're gonna have to um, um, enlarge our industrial footprint, um, but you know rather than building apartments in the industrial park, I would have loved to have seen that maybe piece of industrial land that's there or back over Bond Baker and Third there be apartments. Uh, I'm all for apartments, but sometimes putting them on fresh, usable land in our vital industrial park was, was not the greatest of ideas. So with that being said, I don't really have a problem with where it's at. I'm not sure, where, where do you think we should put it downtown? Where, 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 well, in Wade Park or where? I was, I mean, it, my, I have a recommendation that, okay. that it would be, um, you know, city staff would reevaluate that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, if it can't go where it was, which I think would be awesome. I don't think and I think I don't do that. I, but, I really don't. Um, you know, I went, uh, my wife and I went to the Great Oregon Steam Up in Brooks, mm -hmm. and um, those folks are, are rabid for that. I would love to see that tourism brought to our businesses downtown. But um, the other place would be over there by the where Canby Music is. Oh, sure. In some of in some of that land, but I would leave it up to city staff to try to identify mm -hmm. where it could be. Uh, downtown and really be back in closer to where it was and how the town grew around it. I mean, that's that's where it was. It, it boggles my mind why it is where it is. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I don't have a problem uh, with it. I don't have a problem with what's before us. Uh, if we want to move it at some point, you know, put a trailer hitch on it and throw some axles under it and pull it to the other side of town. I don't have a problem with that. But I do think that we need to get it as a designated historical piece of property that we value and take care of. And I was just going to piggyback onto that and say the two aren't mutually exclusive, correct? I mean, we can do this process, but then also yeah. should, should we decide or the city council or whoever, whoever the powers that be decide, we can, like you say, tug that thing across town and put it where where we need to get more in my, downtown, right? Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, my, my concern is, and I'll, I'll just read my recommendation. If you guys don't want a second and agree with it, we can move on. My concern is, once we do this, the sense of urgency, because we're not in a hurry, but the sense of urgency to do anything further or to look at putting it downtown kind of goes away. And so if we, if we say aye, it goes to, to council, they say aye, it's done, and if people move on with their lives. If we have a chance here to really discuss, and what I would say was, if I put my glass on, um, that I would move that the Canby Planning Commission recommend that city staff reevaluate and propose a motion to give historic protection to the Canby Depot Museum building only, if it's possible, and then seek grants in a process to return the building to Canby downtown. Historical Society would withdraw their application. All right. Well, that's, I mean, uh, why would you do that? There's a whole lot of issues associated with that. that so that makes me very concerned from a planning perspective. Um, I have a, this is Judy. I have a couple things to discuss if I could when I have a chance. Okay, I'll show you. Sorry. No, that's okay, Carol. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I just <clears throat> leave that on the table. Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner Jarosz, please. Thank you. So I think you all know I'm the chair of the Heritage and Landmark Commission. I've been a member of that for four years, and I think for two years the chair. I don't know, Carol, you know. Um, anyway, thank you, Carol, uh, and everyone that's been involved in putting this together. I 
Carol's very uh, modest, but she spent hundreds and hundreds of hours of, you know, she is a professional at this, none of us are, that I know of, uh, of this type of research, all volunteer time on her own. I was very lucky to accommodate her on just one research trip downtown Portland, and I learned a lot. So thank you, Carol, and everyone else that's been involved in this research. And she's right, you go into the, the Depot Museum and you open up some of those back room vaults, if you will, and it's it's amazing. So thank you, thank you for putting this together. I think it's a great thing. Um, I too, I remember when I moved to Canby, I thought, huh, that's kind of a weird place for it. But I also, in my many ex parte communications that I had on this, is I talked to individuals at length who were involved in the move, uh, the original move. Uh, there was a huge number of a volunteer committee. It was volunteers in the city who were very passionate about history, who put you know nails in walls and you know um, you know got monies together and and got funding and. Uh, an amazing, amazing, huge effort for people who recognized what a tremendous asset this is to, to keep in our town. And you're right, they all said it was not going to be allowed to stay where it was. So why they moved it where they did, I don't know, probably because they got land uh, and that's where they had an opportunity to get it moved because the, the railroad needed it out of there. Um, so I invite any of you, talk to Doug Berkland sometime, he's on the HLC and he was on that he was a big part of that move. And I have to wonder, you know, as being part of the HLC for a long time, I think um, some of the uh, interest in history in our town has waned, I think, over time. And that's uh, natural, I think, human nature. People are really focused on the next 20 years of Canby, which is a great thing. Certainly that's, you know, in this group, we talk about that all the time. Uh, but as part of the HLC, I can tell you, it has become very difficult to get volunteers involved in historic or heritage events. It's almost virtually impossible to get grants managed, to get the grant applications to be done. It's not easy, it's time consuming, and hardly anybody, and I mean hardly anybody, is willing to do that or has time to do it. And then to manage the grant projects is even more difficult. And we see this all the time in the HLC and I'm also very involved in the Mark Perry School. So I, I know firsthand there are a handful, less than a dozen, less than half a dozen of people who are willing to do this work and they're all busy. So the likelihood of getting a grant to get something moved, it's not like it was 50 years ago, it's very, very unlikely that that could happen. City staff is slammed, um, and, and like I said, trying to get people to manage those grants and apply for those grants and go through the straight, straight the state grant systems, it's a lot of work, and there just aren't a lot of people that have that time or interest. So anyway, I, I agree that let's get this done, and if we're really impassioned about moving, which would be interesting, but I think finding the reality of finding the ability to get that done is extremely limited. And I just say that having been, you know, the head of the HLC and of now with Mark Prairie with their grants as well. So, but thank you again, Carol. Appreciate it. Uh, could I add something just for clarity? And I just on top of um, Commissioner Jerosha's comments. Just for clarity, uh, the depot is not a city facility. The city does not own this facility. So number one, uh, we have no ownership as part of that. It's it's not owned by us. Uh, secondly, um, this, uh, this action would not preclude the council from further action in the future. In fact, there's been relocations of historic sites um, that have occurred um, subsequent to their original location. Uh, third, uh, the home, the depot is occupying that area now. It's not like we're bringing a use there. It's already there. And I would really uh, try to focus, I'd like to focus on the criteria that are before you, which is, is this historically significant and architecturally significant? Those are, I think, items. Future long range activities is really a council directive and policy level item of discussion. It's, I mean, it's fine to have this discussion, but I'd like to rein this back in to, um, the, I think the immediate need is to protect the building. 
If this overlay does not go on the building, it has no protection. And so that's really the, the immediate need. I think, uh, as was stated as well, grants are really important here uh, for this. I think a longer term could be a discussion with council on this item, but I'd like to rein this back into the conversation regarding criteria. Can I? Add something here. Uh, I agree with you on that. I think we should get this done. But I agree with Chris too. Uh, you know, I think we have a real opportunity. Where I think this town's missing a beat with the fairgrounds. It's one of the unique things we have in this town, and I think we need to build on it better. Uh, but I also think that this this museum is awesome. I think it should. Whatever we do, it needs to grow. Uh, so wherever we put it, wherever it stays, it needs to grow. But for right now, I think. There's flexibility. I'd like us all to keep an open mind, even the council, to request that, because I think there's real, real opportunity with these fairgrounds that we're really missing a beat here with the city, but we'll come back to that later. So I know I, there's a motion on the floor before you ask for a second. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way then, if we would be in agreement to, if we, if, if my motion fails and we do another motion to amend it, to recommend to city council that they, I a grant was just an idea, but the city also has the money to, to do this. And I know from the, I, I listened to Mayor Hodson in the first meeting of the year saying they were not just a council of all no and all yes. And that and, and many of the new councilors ran on preserving Camby's uh, true nature and, and this and that and the other thing about Portland and whatnot. So um, can we make a, can we amend a, like a recommendation that they, look into that when we move it to them? I think there could be a consideration um, uh, for uh, the council. I think <clears throat> if the directive is for the city to take on ownership of this or do a, a, a private, you know, a public private partnership, that would be part of that aspect. But the city really has limited control over this and ultimately the council would have to make that directive. So I think if there is a recommendation to move forward, I think it's not inappropriate to say longer term, we would, the planning commission would like like this to be relocated in a more favorable location to be more attractive for tourism and to complement the downtown area. I, I just think that is the prime, I think the, 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 the basic premise here is to keep focused on, I think, what is before, before you tonight. And I think the recommendation for council to do further investigation, and if, if they want to involve staff in that, then that's great. That's their directive to do that. Thank you. Um, my feelings are that uh, since the protection is mobile along with this, as mobile as the structure is, I think we need to get make sure that we get the, the protection nailed down as soon as we can. Um, and we've talked about that intersection in the past and that it's all, I believe Donzo told us that it's already over capacity. Um, and so I think that we can probably expect some major construction in that zone within the next decade. And I'm not sure that it would, it could stay where it is. Um, and at that point, it would be a really good time to, to look at it because, of course, there's, it's Highway 99 involved in the railway, and, and it'll be a great big party for everyone. Um, and at which point, you know, all kinds of things kind of go up in the air. Um, there's all kinds of large buckets of money out there if we can convince someone else that it's in their best interest to help us move this. Um, you know, looking at the way that the economy is heading, I don't see the city stepping up with a bucket of cash. Um, and I don't want to delay the protection in case some capitalistic urges demand its demolishment for something else, um, which I don't see happening. I mean, I think that where we are now, it's like if we can protect it, where it cedes to the city, if the board that protects it now um, dissolves, um, I think that's probably our best choice forward. Um, but I don't know. I think downtown real estate is probably marginally more valuable than the light industrial where it sits now. And I think you'll have a hard time convincing people to give that up, um, whether the, you're talking about the tax income or, or the space for commercial um, interests. So those are my personal feelings, but we do have a measure on the floor. Is there a second? I second to approve. All right. Well, I suppose that we should vote on uh, sending forth this proposal to council. Well, are you pointing clarity? So 
what he's saying is I made a motion. It was my thing. Okay. So, well, but okay, but let me just ask you though. You're saying approve this thing, but with a caveat. Again, it's a recommendation that we're making to city council. Correct. I, I can withdraw my motion, and then right. I can withdraw my original recommendation motion, I guess, recommendation, um, and then replace it with ap approving it as it written with the additional recommendation to city council, uh, what you said. And yeah, I, I think <clears throat> the general gist of that, I mean, if you want to tailor that, I think that uh, you know, to, for the council to do an explore to recommending the council be complete an exploratory evaluation of a different location in downtown that may be more suitable to um, uh, tourism and economic development, yeah. something to that effect could be uh, appropriate. Okay. Yeah. Does that? Kind of get yeah. the best of both worlds there. Yeah, we're, we're forwarding this on to the city council. Right. Um, you know, if the motion is to, just to be clear, to. Um, I don't have the original motion in front of me. But. Okay. To 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 uh, uh, vote to approve as submitted. I'm I'm good with that. And then with the caveat, when it goes to the city council, that. As a planning commission, we would like to see the possibility of someday they entertain a whatever to, but not have it be part of the approval of the, of the. Well, it's just, yeah. I mean, when we do a recommendation, we can say, and yeah, we'd like to see you explore this or whatever to, to see. It, it could be a recommendation of approval uh, to forward it on to council for approval. Uh, and I think there could be, um, and with the, with the planning commission's uh, desire for council to understand that long term, yeah, that this that there should be consideration for relocating that more towards a downtown location. But the vote is about putting the property on a register. Yeah, yes, yeah, that would be yes. the recommendation to an approval. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Care to state it? Um, I don't. Remember. <laughs> okay. How about I give I it? A, how about I give yeah, it a shot? I can read it. In okay. It. Okay. Um, I the chair moves to um, to approve a recommendation to place the Canby Historical Society Canby Depot Museum on Northeast Fourth Avenue on the local register of historic resources with a request to City Council looking forward in the future to site the depot more centrally in downtown as opportunities present themselves. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I think we have a recommendation to move this under the register. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Judy's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall we move move on to our next item of uh, public hearing? Um, <coughs> item B is DR2205 slash LLA2205, Backstop Brewing, 211 and 241 North Grant Street, Ryan Potter, AICP Senior Planner. Uh, the project applicant requests approval to conduct a Construct a two-story, 11,230 square foot building featuring a rectangular bar, brewery tap room, and a second story dining terrace. Um, tonight there is a matter before the hearing body that requires a public hearing. All questions must be directed through the chair. Any evidence to be considered must be submitted to the hearing body for public access. All written testimony received both for and against shall be summarized by staff and presented briefly to the hearing body during the staff report. Testimony and evidence must be directed toward the applicable review criteria contained in the staff report, the comprehensive plan, or other land use regulations which the person believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by state statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision makers and the parties the opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. 
Conflicts of interest. At this time, I would ask any member of the hearing body who has a conflict of interest, please indicate the nature and extent of the conflict and whether you intend to participate in or abstain from the hearing in the present matter. I have a conflict of interest, unless, of course, Ken has fired me, but uh, so far we're to be the plumber uh, doing this project, and I would definitely directly benefit as the owner of the company <laughs> from such work. So um, I'm super stoked about this project. I can't, I can't wait for it, but I need to step away from the uh, voting. So noted. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Ex parte contact. Also, if any member of the hearing body has any had any ex parte contact with anyone prior to this hearing, please include a visit to the site. Including a visit to the site, please declare the nature and extent of such contact at this time. I've ex parte all over the thing. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm out. <laughs> I have, I have made frequent visits to the site, probably too many visits to the site, um, according to my bank account. But uh, and, and as well, um, I have had conversations with the business owner about uh, his ideas for this. Most of those were before I was on planning commission, but I plan to participate. Um, I patronize the business frequently, um, and I did see preliminary renderings before I heard it was coming before the commission. Um, but considering that my current level of service from the business is exceptional, um, I plan to participate because I figure I'll benefit one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all spend too much time there. Uh, but yeah, I, I haven't had any problem here. I visited the site and I drew no conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> um, does any of the member? Okay. Um, does any member of the audience have any questions for any commissioner regarding ex parte contact or conflict of interest? Okay. <laughs> the public hearing will be conducted as follows: staff five minutes, questions. Chair will open the public hearing for testimony. Applicant, 20 minutes. Proponents, three minutes. Opponents, three minutes. Rebuttal, 10 minutes. Chair will close the public hearing. Questions, if any, then discussion. The decision will be made by the hearing body at the close of this hearing, or the matter will be continued to a date certain in the future. This will be the only notice of that date you will receive. Does anyone have any questions about the procedure? All right. Well, shall we begin with staff? Thank you, Commissioner Hutchinson. Um, Ryan Potter, uh, Planning Manager. So uh, tonight this hearing is for Backstop Brewing. Uh, this is a design review and land use, um, not land use, lot line adjustment um, application package. Um, this is the site. Um, as you all stated just now, um, you're all aware of the site. It is in the heart of Can uh, downtown Canby. It's currently on uh, two parcels. Um, it looks like one if you look at a graphic like this, but the back portion of the project site um, actually is on um, a piece of the parcel that the existing backstop uh, restaurant is on. Um, and so the majority of it, however, would be on what was formerly the Canby Herald building. And um, it's directly adjacent to, um, like I said, the, the existing restaurant and bar. As you can see on this map, um, it's zoned for downtown commercial uses and surrounded by several blocks in every direction of, of other parcels that are um, zoned for the same type of uses. The proposed project is an 11,000 square foot restaurant and bar and brewery tap room um, that would also have a basement. And then on the second floor um, with the restaurant, there would be a outdoor dining terrace facing uh, North Grant Street. Uh, the building would be directly adjacent to Backstop Bar and Grill, and there would be some interior connections between the two buildings so that customers could uh, go back and forth. Um, but they would be, in other aspects, um, separate buildings that are side by side. 
Um, there is one loading berth um, that would be off the alley, and there's no off-street parking. And we'll get into this later, but there that's because there there is no parking required, off, no off-street parking required. And then um, the, the second aspect um, is a lot consolidation um, because the new building would be um, over an existing property line. Uh, my understanding is this process, which is mostly at the county, um, has already um, started, which is the applicant's prerogative. Um, but because that hadn't been finalized yet, I've, I've folded it into um, this application for, um, for a decision tonight. But the law consolidation would just facilitate um, Im implementing the new building. And I've got a number of uh, renderings here. I'm not going to go through these in detail. Um, I believe the applicant's going to um, get up and speak to his project. Um, and I may be going back to these as he uh, speaks. Um, but you can see that um, it would be directly adjacent to the existing two-story uh, restaurant building, and it would kind of match the, the massing and, and size and scale of, of the existing building, uh, which was done intentionally. Um, and so this would really become a, an extension of that urban form uh, that starts on the, the corner of Grant and 2nd Avenue. There's a little bit of a close-up of the street view um, if you're standing in Grant Street. And that's the entrance where the, the two um, people are standing out front. And here are some elevations that shows the same thing. Uh, top right is facing onto Grant Street. Uh, bottom right is facing the alley. Um, and then on the left is uh, a view of the the current backstop building, um, which would obviously block the new one uh, from that view. And then the top left is um, the back of both buildings um, sitting side by side. You can see the Antonia Ballroom on the existing side is a little bit taller um, than the proposed project. So um, here's a list of the applicable criteria. These are the criteria that uh, staff analyzed in the staff report. These are all the normal ones that you would um, analyze a development review pro project on, um, but they include the C1 zone, which is the base zone, and then also the Canby, uh, downtown Canby overlay zone, which is a whole extra layer of regulation for downtown. So consistency with criteria, um, staff did uh, found that uh, this project was exceedingly um, consistent with uh, the criteria in many regards, but I'll just give you a brief summary here. Um, the zone uh, includes a list of allowable uses. Um, three of these are restaurants, drinking places, and brew pubs, which is exactly what the project would be. Um, so this is obviously something that the zoning contemplates. Um, as far as massing and height and um, all those criteria, it is consistent with the code. Uh, there is a design review matrix, and um, this project had the highest score of any project that I've had since I've been here. Um, and I'll get, I'll get into that a little bit um, later. But the downtown can be overlay zone. Uh, this is where, um, as shown in the analysis, this project, um, and I'm not trying to advocate for the project here, that's, that's not my role, but um, this project, if you read through our overlay zone, which is the really robust design, um, urban design chapter for our downtown, and you look at the exhibits and figures of what was intended to go in the downtown core, this, this project is ex exactly that. It's right up against the street. It's got a main entrance that's super visible right, right up against the street. It's got a, 
quite a bit of uh, glazing, both on the first floor and the second floor. Um, it's got a enhanced corner treatment. It, you know, it's just an alley that's on the corner side of it, but the the applicant team has wrapped all the pretty parts of the, the front facade around the corner, so um, they've really hit all the points that the uh, design guidelines and um, development standards in that chapter really were meant to um, address. Um, as I said earlier, uh, for parking, this project is in the um, the rectangle in the middle of our downtown core where no off-street parking is required. Um, and so nothing would really change there. The existing restaurant next door doesn't have off-street parking. Um, signage. This is uh, common with a lot of our de design review projects. Um, there, there is some placeholder signage um, in the in the graphics, but those are just placeholders, and so um, the applicant would come back later with signs. Um, but they they were included to give you a flavor of what it would look like. Um, no lighting study was submitted, um, but the applicant team understands that that's something that um, would need to be submitted later, and there is a condition of approval that addresses that and requires that the, the lighting plan be submitted. Um, and in particular, the condition was written to um, have the lighting plan give some extra consideration to the, some of the uses to the west and northwest which our countryside living are is just to the west of this project, which is a, a senior living facility. Um, and for all of the criteria for the lot line adjustment are easily met. Um, this is a, a parcel that's, or two parcels that are already served by utilities and streets and sidewalks. Um, no new parcels would be created, uh, no additional survey is needed, and it's not in a hazardous location. We received one public comment from a neighboring business owner um, who was very supportive of the project. And then we received um, public agency and department comments from all the usual suspects, including our consulting engineer, public works, uh, can be fire, and can be utility, and direct link. And, and I will say that most of the comments and conditions that they identified were the ones that are typical um, of any development project. They did not illuminate any um, unusual circumstances that would have to be addressed. Um, and accordingly, uh, there are 26 conditions of approval. Um, but like I said, these are almost all standard conditions. Um, that would be apply that would apply to any project. Um, Canby Fire did state that there would have to be uh, the new building would have to be sprinkled uh, inside, and then um, again I've highlighted that a lighting plan uh, will be required. So based on the application submitted and the facts and findings and conclusions in the staff report, um, we are uh, recommending that the Planning Commission approve uh, these two uh, applications and uh, we welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Any commissioners have questions for the staff? All right. I guess we'll open the public hearing part. Would the applicant like to come and address the commission? Oh, uh, for those who don't know who I am, I'm Ken Aragati. Uh, my wife and I are the owner of the Backstop Bar and Grill. Um, this project has been a kind of a dream of mine um, for years and years, and it's just amazing how uh, I feel how fortunate things have moved along to where we're actually at the point that we're at right now with this project. Um, if you can pull up the, uh, the street view, I can kind of describe what we're trying to do. That's perfect. Um, the, uh, the backstop brewing underneath that, that'll be a, um, a tap room there uh, for part of it, like a third of it, and the whole back side of that bottom level will be the brewery, um, which we have hired a brewer who, uh, I can't give up his name at the moment, but he's been a brewer for 
20 plus years and with some big, if I said the name of a company that he was with at one time, you'd know the company. So we have uh, definitely have uh, someone special to help us out with this. Um, the plan is, is the upstairs is going to be a rooftop bar. Um, above the brewery would be all bar area um, and a kitchen. Uh, right now where the ballroom is, which is in the adjacent building there, uh, above the backstop is where the Italian restaurant will be. So we're going to turn that into the Italian restaurant. There'll be two points of entry uh, in that building to get from one side to the other side. Uh, so people can go from the restaurant side into the bar side and vice versa. Um, you brought up a point about the uh, sprinkler system. Not only are we going to have a sprinkler system in the new building, but we are going to extend it into the older building, which does not have a sprinkler system at this point in time. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions you guys have for, for me regarding our project. Um, the Italian restaurant, oh, let, me, let me get to this point, the Italian restaurant, um, my family is Italian and my grandmother was a phenomenal cook and we have some old recipes from that. And also we are getting some uh, consulting from a place called Sylvia's Italian restaurant. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but from the 50s all the way to the late 90s, landmark Italian restaurant in the Portland area. Um, her daughters happen to be uh, acquaintances of, of mine, and so they are going to consult uh, with some recipes with that too. So we're excited about that. So anyhow, that's all I have to really say, I guess, at this point, unless you have questions. I don't have any. Any questions from the commission? Um, all right, do I guess, Thank you for your presentation. Sorry about that. Um, do we have any proponents who would like to speak on this project? Any opponents? All right. Um, probably no rebuttal then. At this point, we'll close the public hearing. What's that? Okay. Uh, questions by the hearing body? Any discussion? I have a few questions, if I could. Go ahead, Commissioner. Okay. They're all based on my review of the design review narrative, and they're specific and nothing significant. Some of them are just, I don't know, things I didn't quite understand, perhaps. So the first one is 16.10.080, uh, the street tree plan. And it mentions that it's not applicable because the existing frontage has angled parking. And I'm not sure what's not applicable. I agree. Because like the other streets in downtown have angled parking and they all have street trees. That's the, so it's just a confusion on my part. I'm not sure I understand that. Commissioner DeRoche, would you be able to point me to the, the page that you're looking at? Oh, let's see. Page 10. It's 16.10.080. The project narrative in response to code criteria file. Attachment B. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Um, in, the, in the applicant's narrative. Let me look at that. Yes, so, so page 10, 16.0080. Right. right. Correct. Yeah, so this is um, the applicant's narrative. Um, I guess this didn't jump out to me, but you're right. They, they would have to provide street trees just like anything else. Um, I don't recall if there's pockets there in the parking that, that could accommodate trees. No, not. And, and, may, and maybe that's why. That was their response. If I can say something, if you, if you go. I can't hear you. 
This, this is something that I actually brought up um, at one point in time that I would love to see happen. But if you go from where Cuts First is all the way to Grant, they extended the sidewalks out about three feet where they'd added all that, those, and that the project, the city project stopped at my spot. And I was hoping at some point in time that project can extend out. I think I've talked a couple times to a few of you about, about the process of that and what happened. I think the first, and it was supposed to go further than that, was what I was told. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. And then the first street project came up and then that stopped at that point in time. But we don't have that space like from all the way from Cuts First to, to Grant that the other places have. I would love to see it, but. Well, what does it mean the existing frontage on Grant has angled parking because second has angled parking and they have street trees. That was, I didn't understand that comment. Well, I, I think there are some streets in downtown that have those pockets where the tree could be and some don't. Um, I know that Public Works did review uh, the plans for this and their, their intention was that the street scene wouldn't change for this project, that they were just hoping or they were asking that the parking and the sidewalk and everything remain how they, how they are. Um, so I'm not, Don, I don't know if you have any comments on this. Um, and this is just the applicant's uh, narrative, right, Ryan? This is not your staff report? Correct. Okay. Um, I, I guess the, the question uh, for Ken is, is, is that a challenge for this project to have street trees in front of the site? Well, well, there's no place to put them, I guess. Okay. Where would they go? Yeah, okay. They, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. That, because there's no pockets. The okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess that does need to be kind of discussed. Then, um, I, I, you know, I, I think that one of the themes here is, um, uh, uh, and I guess maybe longer term on the sidewalk extension piece. I mean, I. You know, I think the building is pretty amazing what you've come up with on uh, terms of the design standard. You've exceeded all the standards. I think the street tree element, if it's not possible to be put in there, um, that would probably be something that, I mean, it's more in the public works code, but I would see a rationale for like making an exception here. Well, we, we like it for yeah. the architecture to come all the way yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Side, right? and that, that's the intent. I mean, we're getting into the intent of the design standards in many ways here. And I think that, I mean, what is proposed here is pretty amazing. I mean, in terms of like looking at the amount of uh, glazing and how that's coming out to the street. So I, I think that that one element, I don't see that as being that significant. It's not like a building element, so um, yeah. Can I add yeah. one thing? Um, we're not changing anything on the grant side of the yeah. building, and so it's just along the second side, second street side of the building is where the new building is going. The, the backstop bar and grill mm -hmm. building stays the same. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if there are trees along second street where they've come out along, I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, along yeah, Grant yeah. Street. Yeah. Along 2nd Street, there is. Yep. And as time goes on, I'd still love, I'd love to see that mm -hmm. project move out. But where we're doing the brewery, mm -hmm. there's no, right. there is no trees going down that unless mm -hmm. you get to the park, you know? Yep. 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 No, I, I, and I, I would say that would be something, Ryan, I would be supportive of not requiring based on the design that he's come up with. Well, right, which is consistent with Public Works' review of this project, okay. where they indicated that sure. no frontage requirements were needed okay. yeah. or required, uh, except for repairing sidewalks or, or portions of the alley that are affected by construction. Then Commissioner Jarosh, that is our recommendation, and, and to the rest of the, the commission as well, that we would recommend that would be in place here for as part of this approval. Right, yeah, and as I mentioned, I have a few questions, but I think they're all minor. But the way I look at this is very black and white, Don. I say there's a street tree plan and, this, and the response is not applicable. Well, is it or isn't it? If it is and there's an exception, that's fine. But I, to me, it is applicable. And I would say that we are saying it's consistent with the intent by, okay. not, by not having the street trees would be how I would, we would make a finding to that effect. Okay. Yeah. 
And then uh, the next one is the drive up uses. This came up a lot during the, you know, the COVID. Um, not applicable, but mm -hmm. several stores or restaurants have a spot with a sign that's, you know, basically saying this is for people like Grubhub or whoever. So is that not considered a drive up use? Um, I think I, I don't believe so. I think my belief if a drive up would not be a Grubhub can, parking spot. I mean, that seems okay. Like, yeah, that, that yeah, that would be like a drive up for like a bank or like Burgerville. I would consider or, that yeah. a drive through, but okay. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I I I do think that's maybe not for this project, but as we go into our transportation system plan update uh, later this year, I think curb management is going to be one of the things we're discussing and uh, from a policy standpoint, which yeah. involves how do you accommodate some of those more modern uh, delivery and pickup services. Um, yeah. But, it, but yeah. in this case... I've been in some meeting with some other cities and their downtown historic districts and how they've had to manage that in the last few years. So yeah, it's an ongoing discussion. I just had a question about that terminology, drive up versus drive through. My next one is on 16, it's item F2. Uh, sidewalks, a minimum of 11 feet in width shall be required in commercial locations. And then the response says this, the existing sidewalks is eight feet. They do not plan to change the width. So my question is, because they're tearing the building down, does that mean we grandfather the old sidewalk width or do we require the current 11 feet width if they're going to tear the building down. This was something we had discussed internally amongst staff and amongst departments and all departments were comfortable with them matching existing and yes you're correct they are tearing down the building um, but the the massing and the elevation of the wall plane um, would match what's next door. Um, and I would just like to add, uh, Commissioner Jaros, that's that is the existing building edge, which is again consistent with bringing the building up to the face of the public realm. Um, and again, back to the shortage of the three feet that might be added by the city over time, you know, that would make up the difference. That's on the other side and right away. That okay. would be my opinion on that. So I would agree that with Ryan on what he's saying. Right. And, and I was the applicant isn't planning to change it because the city's agreed to grandfather it. And I understand the design yeah, yeah. implications yeah, and all that. Yeah. So, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, then on the same page, number F4, uh, let's see, uh, shall be oriented to the street. The main entrance shall be oriented. The proposed building has the main entry off North Grant within three feet of the right of way. I'm not sure. I just a question of ignorance. What is what is that right away exactly? The person, um, Commissioner Drosch, give me one second to to read this section. Okay. Well, I, I would say in this case, the right of way is the sidewalk, which is part of the public realm. Um, and in this case, I believe that the front door is actually planned to be exactly three feet from that front elevation plane. The, the entryway is re recessed a little bit from the sidewalk. Um, so I, I think that that one's, as stated, is, is correct. Okay. So it's the sidewalk. In, the, in this case, yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then on... 17, which is the grid, the number grid on page 17, the last item, windows. Um, and I just noticed it's because I always do the math, um, the windows regularly spaced. And if it's the response is the score is one out of two. And we know this is a very high scoring, but two is highlighted. So I'm not sure I understand. Should, shouldn't one be highlighted? Well, in, in in the staff report, I actually um, we uh, sorry, I'm losing my words here. Uh, we scored the this table slightly different um, from the applicant team in a couple ways, and that was one of them. And we actually 
thought that it was worth two, that they had scored two points with the level of glazing that's on this front facade. Um, that it's it's definitely seventy percent or more. Um, and so, regardless of what the applicant had said, we awarded them two points. Okay, but the way it stands, this is not correct. Right, and I and okay. it's that's yeah. Fine. Yeah, there's a you couple know, different ways. The fine tooth comb, just to see, you know, if I understand what it's saying or not. So that's sure. That's all the questions I had about that. Thank you, Commissioner Drove. You're welcome. Any further discussion? Yes, I have a few things. Okay, if I may. Um, okay, so this is going to be. Uh, Great project. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I was in down, involved in this whole downtown thing when we did window glazing and, and what we wanted downtown to look like. Perfect. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm good with this. So this is, uh, this. we've got the Dahlia building. I think this building are gonna be two anchors for our downtown. And I'm hoping that it's going to be a flower that blossoms moving forward. A uh, couple of questions though for staff and possibly for applicant. Um, the um, one thing that I see that this does is, is this is going to open up a, um, a, a um, this is where we need to start looking at our alleys, okay? Um, I know that when we participate in things in the downtown area, a lot of times we will use the alleys as crossways rather than walking all the way around our great big blocks. So our alleys are, and the alleys have always been a thing, you know, what do we do with them, so, you know, so on and so forth. I personally would love to see the city council get on board with making our alleys pedestrian walkways. Uh, and 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 when we have a project like this that our alleys are kind of beautified and and brought up to speed. So many of our alleys are gravel, uh, major holes. I'm sure there's been cars and people lost in those holes uh, that we don't even know about. Uh, but we have projects like this. It would be really really great when they come into the planning process to say this is our criteria for alleys, and we'd really really like the alleys to look like this and uh, <clears throat> because this is how people get to our street dances they get to uh, Wake Park all, all of the above we've got families walking down these alleys and I think that this project just brings to bear how important our alleys are becoming because that's how we get around okay now I'm going to say that because I want to preface uh, there seemed to be a little bit of contention as to where the garbage is going to be Okay, now I look at this rendering, uh, I look at that rendering, and uh, the one on the bottom right corner, right there, um, I'm seeing a dock door. Uh, I'm seeing probably what looks like possibly another garage door there to the left, maybe. But one place it says that the, the garbage is going to be kept inside, and one place it says it's going to be outside. What's going to be? Uh, the applicant might have additional comments. My understanding was that that whole room behind that garage door on the far right on this lower right graphic was the interior garage room. Okay. Um, I know that's what you said in your, uh, in your thing. He's correct. He's correct. Okay. Because in your rendering, it uh, talked about it being uh, fenced outside. No, so. we, we extended the whole... Uh, building out, mm -hmm. and so this garage door here mm -hmm. is going to be—it's going to be a separate room contained the door inside of it, but it will be the garbage area, recycling area. Perfect. Okay. So this garage door here, and this actually will open up too. This garage door here is into the brewery, so we can move kegs in and out. Okay. Stuff like that. And that's just a doorway. Like Perfect. Here. That answers that question because, as I said, as we move along and our alleyways become basically wide, 
pedestrian travel through fares. It'd be great if we could just get rid of the garbage cans somehow. Um, yeah, so that's, that's good. That answers that question. Uh, the next question I have is that our code says that, uh, help my memory here, I think it's 5,000 to 20,000 square foot building uh, needs to have its own loading dock uh, facility, okay? Now, I've noticed, at least what the way I read this, is that they're planning on these proper, there, there are two lots here, and they're still going to retain a single, there, there's still going to be two lots there. So at some point in time, if the family wanted to say sell one building or whatever, we have we have one building that will have a loading dock and one building that will not have a loading dock. So has that was that discussed at all? Well, part of this project is the lot consolidation because they have to do that to because they would otherwise be building over a property line. So with approval of the project, it'll actually be on one. Okay, That's, I didn't know whether the lot line adjustment was to take up that back corner, in the back corner there that we were just fixing that, or if they were actually, this is going to be one property. One yes, lot. it would be one property, it would okay. consolidate. Okay, good, because I was a little unclear on the first map because it showed that. And then to follow up with what's already been said, and that question has, I think, already been answered, they're gonna tear the existing Canby Herald building down. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. And then they're going to put a basement underneath it, and then we're going to have this beautification on top of the on top of that. Okay, good. Um, I've already talked a little bit about transitional areas, but in our DCO, when we talk about transitional areas between things, in especially specifically to this area, it, transitional areas were talked about quite a bit. I didn't quite understand what transitional areas we were talking about. Are, are, the, are the alleys a transitional area or? I, if you're, I think you're speaking to one area of, this, of the, the code in the DCO chapter that talks about when uh, projects uh, meet or exceed a certain percentage of the block. They're supposed to have transitional areas like an arcade or a courtyard or something like that that unifies um, the different pieces of that block. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, the, e even together, the two buildings don't meet that percentage of the block. And because they are uh, keeping the existing backstop bar and grill, it obviously precludes them from building something like that along the edge of it that would unify them, like a colonnade or something. Okay, you know. good. I'll, I'll take that. Um, it, and we've talked a little bit about the alley thing. Uh, like I said, it's, it's a little late in the game. Are you planning any resurfacing in the alley, whatnot, fixing that thing up? I think, I, think, I think that's part of it. Yes, in any par portion of the alley that they impact, which would be likely if they're, you know, because they're building the basement underneath, there's going to be some excavation involved, that they would have to repair it back to how it would be. And, there, and there's a condition of approval to that. Is effect. that a, a half alley? <laughs> we call them half street improvements or, or whatnot sometimes. Is that a half alley improvement or a full alley improvement? Um, that... It would. My understanding is it would just be what was at whatever was affected um, by their construction activities, um, but that would be something that the applicant would have to work out um, during the uh, pre-construction conference with Public Works. Okay. Okay. Um, we talked about the street trees. Uh, I think that that would be something I would love to see the city keep that, move that project on down uh, the street and, and get that uh, get that taken care of. Um, the, um, I'm trying to think if I got anything else here. I think that's about it. Oh, one other thing. Uh, we've got the, um, we've got the, um, is it a dentist office that's across the alley from you? Uh, doc, uh, no, it's a lawyer. A lawyer office? Okay. So that lawyer office has got some parking behind it. 
And as valuable as our parking is downtown and with the attention that this is going to draw, I'm just wondering if we shouldn't have the uh, applicant put some signs up just for the benefit of the other landowners that that parking lot is not available for uh, uh, backstop bar and grill and brewery and Italian restaurant and all things food um, uh, to have some signage in there. I, I would like to see a, a, a requirement for that. You have a problem with that? No, there, there's already signage there. Oh, there is. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, I didn't see it. I didn't look. I was looking left. I didn't look right when yeah, I went down the down the alley. Spot. He has a sign that says just for his parking. Okay. Good. So that's that. Because I, I I know that I cheat and park in his parking lot when we do something downtown. So it's it's a. It, yeah. I just say it right now. Let's get the tow truck out. Um, so yeah, that's uh, as long as that signage is there. I don't think that I've got you know parking is. <sighs> It's an issue, but it's going to be an issue with anything that we have downtown. And I would really, really encourage the city council to, if, if there becomes a lot becomes available or whatever, to, to buy it and pave it so we've got some parking. That would be my thing. Talk to Frank. Get that. Well, that's ours. The, um, there, that is all public parking over by the cinema. So there okay. is a large public parking for people to utilize when they come downtown and spend their money. All right, very good. Uh, I was also gonna say really quickly, the, the law office that you refer to, I believe that's the letter of support that we got was from that particular business mm -hmm. owner. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure yeah. they take clients to lunch. <laughs> really close. <laughs> okay. I, I, I just wanted to say- okay. I, I have no, uh, no other, no other gigantic issues with this. I think it's a, a project that will do our town well, and I hope other people are watching this, and I hope it's successful so we get more, because that's what we need down there. I'm done profonicating now. Any other commissioners care to, care to speak? Um, I'll just say that um, I it's, well. It sounds like, as far as questions and discussion, I think commissioners uh, Ewart and Jaroche really dotted the uh, I's and crossed the T's on this. Um, to digress just for a second about the alleyways, Don, you remember one of my very first things a year ago, uh, Commissioner Padden and uh, Jerry and Spencer, and we had that discussion about the alleyways, and here we are. I'm not. It didn't seem like much happened after that, but maybe uh, maybe the new council will be the council that hits the ground running. We'll see. Um, I will say that uh, I'm very excited uh, for this. I'm very excited to uh, have a cheat day and load up on lots of carbs in the future. I'm sorry. I guess I'm not completely done. Microphone? Microphone. <laughs> Microphone. I have one. Yes, right here. Um, there was one other thing about Canby Utility, and they said that the electric overhead line is going to be put underground. And I noticed that in the narrative for the applicant, they said that the new transformers were going to be put on a new pole, and 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 put on the new transformers are gonna be put on the existing pole and brought into the building. So I guess my question is, which is it? Are they gonna, are we gonna get it underground, which is where I think it should be, or are we putting it on the pole and bringing it into the building? I'll admit, I, I'm, I don't think I can really speak to that. I, I, th I can answer that, because I, I was there. I'm good with that. I, this is how I understand okay. what was going to go, is that the pole that's there, they're going to add a transformer to, and they're going to draw a pipe straight and bring down. And it in from the pole then, into the building. And it's going to go under the ground okay. into the building. That's how I... So we're not going to have a, a, a bedded transformer. No, it's still going to... The, the way I understood, mm -hmm. it, it, I was there when they were all talking about it, was that it was going to be put on the pole still. Okay. But I'd it like, was gonna go straight down into the ground and then the I'd really the, the like line. to get rid of those poles. Yeah. I really would. But that's so, Oh no, that's where that's all the five G cabinets go. What's that? That's where all the five G cabinets go. go. And you're not allowed to deny those. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, okay, and I think I was just looking back here. Um, 
Oh, one question I have. I noticed that this project is gonna be paying SDCs. When a project like this goes in downtown and they pay, pay SDCs, that, does that just go into a pot or does that go into a separate pot that is spent for just downtown? The SDCs, it would go into the, into the pots of the respective funds for parks, stormwater, streets, and transportation. Okay. There's there's only one bucket to answer your question. Yes. There could be more than one bucket as we go through the SDC update process, which will be part of the transportation system update. That th there could be districts. There aren't. There's just one district. It's the entire I think city. it would be really really yeah. cool if we when we do d discuss this, Don, that we add another bucket so that when really great projects like this come into our downtown, the Dahlia, this one. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that there will be others that they those those monies go to beautify the areas that those things are in. I'm not saying that the rest of the town is not important, but everything else, everything pays into those. Mm -hmm. But for the downtown area, I'd really, really like to see something like that. Just FYI. I'm done now. Further discussion? All right, do we have a motion from anyone? Mr. Chair, I would like to make a motion that we approve the DR 22-05 slash LLA. Do I need to do two or can we do it in one motion? Uh, LLA 22-05 backstop brewing as submitted. Um, did we have any other additions that we should put to this? I think with the recognition that um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the um, existing, we, those are the two two items where the existing sidewalk is you know it, it is not needing to be extended, and that the uh, street trees are being waived for the project. Do we need to make those conditions of approval or just? I would just make a, that part of the motion. Okay, very good. I make that as part of my motion to approve. Second. Shall we go down the list? Uh, Commissioner Ellison. Abstain. Abstain. Um, Commissioner Jarosh. Aye. Commissioner Calkins. Aye. Commissioner Luan. Aye. Excuse me. Uh, Commissioner Ewart. Aye. And I as well also vote aye. Motion is passed. Um, congratulations. Yeah. You've got some work to do. Um, so I understand we have some items of interest from the planning staff. Um, Thank you, Commissioner Hutchinson. Uh, just a few um, items to cover. I'm going to go through both A and B. Uh, for the next uh, Planning Commission uh, meeting, we'll have a work session. It'll be on housing, um, the housing needs analysis update. Uh, we'll have, I know you've heard about this before. I'm continuing to give you information as this comes up. Uh, that kind of leads into my my director's update and i'll give you kind of the sequence of what those are um, i think it's going to be really important this the planning commission in particular is going to be taking on a lot of recommendation roles uh, for long-range uh, projects and i think it's important that you're up to speed on those as that moves forward through the planning commission to recommendation to council so just kind of in terms of the next items that are on the horizon here there's a final housing advisory committee meeting on January 17th that we're having uh, there will also be a city council work session on January 18th the next night uh, that's going to be on the housing update and it'll be a discussion around uh, the uh, discussion around housing and the the what goes into that in terms of uh, the uh, methodology for that. Is that a joint meeting? It's actually just with the council. Okay. Uh, and then there'll be an open house for housing and economic uh, open house on January 24th, uh, 6 p.m. here in council chambers. 
then there will be a joint work session uh, with uh, council and planning commission on March 1st uh, for a discussion of that. Um, and then we're intending to have the planning commission hearing for the housing production strategy. Those will be strategies that will be part of the adoption process for the housing production strategy uh, for planning commission's review on March 13th. Uh, that will be recommended to the council. And then the other part of that is the economic opportunity analysis and the planning commission would be hearing that we're anticipating on March 27th. And then the council would hear the housing production strategy hearing on April 19th. And the uh, council would hear the economic opportunity analysis on May 3rd. Um, so these are all kind of part of the grants that we're working for and trying to wrap this all up by the end of May for both, uh, both projects. Uh, so these kind of set the stage for the comprehensive plan, which is also starting and will be starting at the end of the month. We'll be doing a kickoff with the consultants. There is a uh, advisory group. We have a list which has not been completely formalized. It's a quite large list. We're trying to not have a giant group that's completely unwieldy, but also to have really good representation across the city. So uh, we're working on that as staff and internally. Uh, more to come on that, but the, the comprehensive plan will be starting up with this advisory group and a bunch of outreach as well, um, including websites, uh, website updates. We're planning to engage the newspaper with a uh, news release um, and doing a very broad brush um, outreach so people know what's happening. So that's up and coming. Uh, if there's any questions on those, glad to answer anything you guys have. Where's the, uh, uh, what do they call it, the beer beer library, brew library, the, the library? Where the, does that come? I've read in the paper that they're... The beer, uh, Ryan is handling the staff report on that, but the beer library, they're, they're going through a the, the permit process now. Ryan, did you want to give a brief update on that? Yes, I don't believe they've submitted yet, but the, okay. there, there will be a a redesign coming of that um, consistent with what you saw in the news. Like um, in the paper like they had submitted, but they haven't submitted it. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't believe they've formally submitted, but they've, they've had a, a pre-application yeah. conference, so the, the ball has been rolling with re us reevaluating the, the revised project. I, I read in the Oregonian that the OLCC submitted and they're going to break ground in spring. That's what I heard, too. Yeah. yeah. Morgan. No, <laughs> they have not. May, 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 <laughs> yeah. they, 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 they've not submitted their application, so that's yeah. We yeah. Great. Yeah, I mean, but there are things on the. You're going to get kind of you know these long range, and then mixed in with uh, uh, you know. Uh, development review uh, project so more and uh, and i think as we're in like a weird economic point and i think we're i think we will continue for the time being seeing some projects come back as revised projects i think that's sort of normal so i would i would expect that several things that you might have already reviewed you know might might come back i, I wouldn't be surprised by that uh, some of those are through modification processes. Thank you, Ryan, on that. And then, Jamie, you mentioned that there will be an update for, on the beer library by the applicant uh, I, I, or is the council on next Wednesday So for the council meeting. So that will be on the discussion part there as well. Excellent. Anything else? Walnut. Walnut, 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 oh, yeah. uh, Walnut Street Extension. Yes. Um, the latest on that is that um, there, the application for the Oregon Department of Transportation access permit has almost been submitted. Um, this is being driven by uh, Kurt McLeod. They're doing the work with uh, DKS. They're really close to the final um, Submittal on that. Uh, Ryan and I were in a meeting last week also with Canby Utility, and there's some items there that on water, looking at water use in that area as well, that uh, will likely be added into that mix. So it's addressed. So there's a, co a cohesive uh, 
review of utilities when that happens. It is a priority project. Uh, it does need to get going and, and moving forward. Um, we see that as a critical link to both uh, traffic relief as well as that area J that we think will end up providing uh, a good mix of uses out there um, long term. All right, well, I have an announcement, an exciting announcement. It's exciting for me and maybe exciting for some of you. Gordon in the booth, your, your wife will be really excited to hear that this was my last planning commission. I will have to resign tonight. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, fully, it's been such a pleasure and an honor to, to serve on this board. And I think I've, I've agreed and disagreed with everyone here. And that's the sign of a good, vibrant board and it's always been really thoughtful and respectful and I would have loved to have continued on and I think my wife would have continued to win election after election but with our uh, our current careers and our uh, the exciting things happening with our hip-hop duo um, we are moving on from Camby to uh, to other environs, and so um, that uh, yeah, I would decided to uh, make this sort of my last one. I think um, oh, I, was, I had a bunch to say, but now I'm I'm uh, I'm forgetting. But but uh, it's just it's just really been an honor. Oh, I wanted to thank the people of Camby on our uh, social media pages for viewing and sharing some of a certain number of our uh, hip hop videos. The views really help propel our career, and so um, so. I know it, it's, it's probably unexpected, but but it really is. We're, we're in April. We'll be uh, performing in Minneapolis, um, and then uh, hopefully we'll be doing kind of a West Coast, maybe a tour or something like that. Um, if you want to follow, uh, everything's on chriswaffle.com. That's where all the tour dates will be. Um, and uh, my wife started a very exciting, uh, really high-profile big job. And we're doing a lot of traveling, and we just thought it's probably best to, to move on to new and exciting adventures. Um, I want to thank the staff especially. Um, you guys have been awesome. Thank you for making the job of a commissioner so easy to understand. Um, for me, all the hard work you do. Send my uh, thanks to uh, Brianna uh, as well, and on all of your your hard work um, and, and all those. You know, I had to read it all, but you actually had to make it. <laughs> you know, that really takes it to a, a whole nother level. So um, thank you for that. Um, you know, I'll still be around. I'll be back for Aragatis for sure. Um, and the beer library and all that stuff will still be around. But um, anyway, thank you. Thank you all. And, and good luck, uh, Chair thank Ellison you. and Vice Chair Ewer. You guys are going to do a great job. Chris, was you that, was that a motion? <laughs> <laughs> I vote no. <laughs> Anything like this where you're going to leave, you have to run it by us. Right have a motion well, we'll vote on Just that. when we <laughs> almost got to a full uh, 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 like yeah, two yeah. steps forward, yeah. one step back. Yeah. Chris, we'll be you'll be missed. And um, great questions uh, that you've asked. You challenge staff and. Um, you know, we had to, you know, really help, I think, in that process. So it was two ways on your questions required us to uh, really dive pretty deep on some stuff. But I really appreciate your commentary, and um, you'll be missed on this on this commission. No, thank you. I'd like to say something as well. It's one of the things that I think that you really brought is how... Uh, how it all affects the the different the planning commission tends to look at we look at paperwork, but it, it, it's really about the people and where they live and how they interact with their environment. And uh, appreciate you bringing that into the conversation when you did. Um, as for myself, hopefully this will be my last chair for the planning commission. I plan to continue to run another term and I am very happy to hear that we have a chair and a vice chair that are enthusiastic to move forward and I can move back to the margins where I belong. <laughs> uh, and with that, I'll entertain a move, move to adjourn. I move to adjourn this meeting. Second. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Bye.